So there is a bit of a question that was asked, and I'm not sure we're, we're really here to answer it, but I think um, you know, this, this notion of this new economy um, can be a little bit confusing. Um, I, think, I think there's so many different business models that have been talked about here, you know, from, from Tom Dixon that's licensing his name and, and, um, and who's going to come back as, uh, as uh, Dick Thompson next year, um, to, you know, Hartmut Esslinger, who, uh, who has hundreds of people working with him, um, to Zay, for example, um, Zay Frank, who um, uh, dances for money. You know, and, and if, there were, if there are business people in here, I think, I think they would be quite confused because you know, th there's no predictable cycles. Um, there's no, there are no models that seem that we can replicate. Um, and um, I think that's what is interesting about design um, because design can, ex can exist in, in these different ways and there's so many different ways that we've seen. Um, it can enhance existing business models, uh, refer to the past, um, it, ca it can also create completely uh, new ones. Um, and so what is typical about what we do, uh, maybe what is typical about what we do is what we've been doing the last um, three days, sharing ideas, brainstorming, um, you know, creating through um, this kind of exchange. And um, I think, you know, one, one thing about design and money is that I think there's always this conflict since, since design at the beginning of it is very much, um, I think, a, gener a generous endeavor. Um, it's a rel relatively new field, um, and it's, um, you know, it, it still benefits from inventing and reinventing itself on a, on a regular basis. Um, and in a way, I don't know if I, this is kind of a, a, a leap, but in a way, I think it makes complete sense that there's 2,000 people here in South Africa listening to design because maybe a little bit like, um, like design, there's a sense of change, of newness, of opportunity, um, and there's a lot of problem solving that is needed here as well. Um, so, so the hope, the dream, and the intent of maybe getting here together um, is to participate in what could be. Um, and um, you know, maybe what, what I'm looking for is, um, and, and there was a conversation last night with Marcus, is uh, maybe there's somebody in this room that just wants to tell us to bug off and who's going to do something completely different from everything that's been presented here and who thinks that we're fundamentally wrong. Um, and in a way, a lot of the people that, are presented, that have presented here started from that point of view, um, started with kind of their, their, their own view of what the future is um, and, um, and uh, what, you know, what the future will bring. Albert Einstein said um, that he's not interested in the future. Um, he just knows, he said, I just know that it happens very fast. And I think there's a sense of, of this here as well. So I'll tell a little bit of my story because I don't think I'm gonna escape that part. Um, and, and you know, maybe initially, I think what, what, is it, what, what was interesting for me is that design can mean so many different things. It's what children play with, um, and on another continent, uh, it's the most mundane objects that are turned into um, a next game. You know, this is a wheelbarrowfreestyle.com. Um, you can actually see these kids in the Midwest of America doing these, these crazy tricks. Um, so, <clears throat> rather than being style and lifestyle driven though, I think, I think what we look for, and what I look for in design is this notion of relevance. Um, you know, here there was a solution in how you protect yourself from being cold, um, you know, through through the fur of the bear, through the, um, through the bone of the animal um, to, to, to protect you, you know, from the wind. But, um, you know, obviously this is not probably the design solution to the, to the problems we have today. Um, you know, in, in, in this global culture, there is um, relevance is, is really driven uh, by all the context, con contextual issues and all the, the complicated issues that, that we live through, whether it's, you know, the re religious and cultural issues that, um, that drive us these days, and I think we've kind of learned the hard way uh, recently, um, or whether it's traditional social, social standards, or whether it's when these social standards are changed and exploded, and when fake fur replaces animal fur. So this kind of complexity that we live in um, 
you know, is, is both about these global drivers and these, lo these local drivers. Tom D Dixon said, um, global is, is uh, uh, local is a new global. But our notion of what is local and global has also changed. And, um, and uh, they're inherently related. They're, it, they're inherently mixed, whether we, uh, we like it a lot or, or not. So there is a time of confusion. You know, do we refer to the vernacular? Um, 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 and there is really no clear winning trend. Um, so, six years ago, I started a, um, a studio called Fuse Project. And of course, I went in and I wanted to do, I wanted to go beyond cliches and I wanted to reinvent new categories. And my first client, my first client that came in uh, asked me to put Mickey Mouse on a children's uh, shampoo bottle. And, um, you know, it's, it's called pimping the mouse, actually. So, <clears throat> and, um, and, and, and as Lee Edelcourt said yesterday, if, um, what she said is, if I see another detail in a bag or a shirt, I'm going to puke. Well, six years ago, I said the same, well, I didn't say exactly the same thing to my clients, but I wanted to. Um, and it was all about form. And as she said yesterday, it's really all about the substance and the form. Um, so initially, what I started working on were um, these projects, this, this project, for example, where I really felt that the form itself could express some of the things um, that, that were unique about this particular product. In this case, asymmetry, touch, um, the fact that this bottle always seems to be growing um, was, was um, something I, was, um, I wanted to express in there. And I think it was sort of a positive uh, outcome of, of a project that could have gone um, quite wrong. And then on the other end of the spectrum, um, very recent project, um, Nadia Swarovski has approached uh, designers to reinvent her own world, which is a world of crystal, in a way, a world which um, was becoming um, you know, not very, not very related to contemporary culture. Um, you know, these old chandeliers that are hanging there. Um, and of course, now people are saying, well, the old chandeliers are beautiful, but I'm not sure that that would have happened unless she had kind of put her own name and her own brand forward and uh, given people a chance to, um, to explore what, you know, what, how you could bring traditional, this tradition of crystal together with new technologies. So in this case, we brought in electroluminescent film with crystal and created this, um, 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 this unique experience. But where we started was the same place maybe of where we started with the shampoo bottles, which everything was electronic and we tried to figure things out um, on the computer. Obviously what happened is computers can't figure out gravity. So all these drawings really ended up in, in utter failure. And we went, we went back to um, chains and paper clips in order to figure, figure out the exact uh, forms that we were looking for. And we would send these, um, uh, you know, we would learn from essentially the shapes created by the chains and the paper clips, send them to Germany to this metalsmithing shop, this amazing place near Cologne. And then, you know, we would, go back and forth um, with this craft until we got to, to, um, to, this, um, to, to, the, to the complete piece. And then we went on a little bit later to even, we, we wanted to go a little bit further with the next project, which originally was intended for uh, an exhibit at, the muse at um, JFK in New York, which is the um, airport terminal there. And we went completely sort of out of scale, completely crazy on this one. I mean, this is, the inner structure and how the inner structure is constructed. Um, and the inner structure gets removed by a master welder. So all that you are left with is the framing and the lines um, around um, that are, that are self-supportive. And this is some of the um, data that had to be created for it. And the result was not just the crystal in the fluid form, but it was also um, 2,000 LEDs that were reacting to people's movement around the object. And there was uh, quite a little bit of magic that happened when people actually interacted um, uh, with a piece and moved around it.
and eventually it was installed as well in um, in, uh, in the airport. But I liked it a lot better in that um, in that smaller uh, confined space. So. Early on when I started Fuse Project, I said design brings stories to life. And I later discovered by accident, as, as so many design um, things happen, um, that these words are exchangeable. Stories bring design to life. Life uh, brings stories to design. And it became kind of this magical sentence through which um, I started to express some, maybe the human element um, and how we make uh, objects connected. And these stories um, are often connected to the past um, and they're a little bit like bridges. Um, they can connect the past and the future. And I think design in a way is in a unique position to create bridges. Um, again, whether it's like Annika just showed us between a vernacular and, 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 and a new interpretation of it. Um, so the important element for me was is though that design is built from the inside out, that it is not so much about style, that it is not about so much about repeating, uh, uh, exploring a certain icon, but something that is derived out of ideas and stories. About two years ago, uh, UNESCO went to a few designers and asked them to answer a question. Uh, and the question is um, pretty simple. It's love, what is it? So inner light isn't about the surface, it's about what's inside. Um, and again, there we, we explored this new material, which is the electroluminescent film. Um, and we've, the, um, the rings were formed by these sort of California craftsmen. And I think you can see a little bit uh, some of the environment into, into which you know, this explorat explorative work sometimes happens. Um, but this, this guy is, is completely amazing. He even, he wrote uh, one ring that rules them all on the, um, on the, on the piece up there. Um, so he formed out of a, out of a, a, a piece of the metal, he formed um, these, these uh, that's the guy actually, right there. He formed these, these really cool rings and then we placed the, the film on the inside which creates this magic glow and the result when these were exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art um, in San Francisco, um, the result was actually uh, quite taking and, um, and sort of corresponded to what I was trying to, um, to express. Similarly, when, when we worked for sort of real clients, um, I, I really sort of try to approach problems in the same way. Um, these are not designs that I do for me or for my own self-expression, but rather um, I try to work with those clients in order for um, their brands and their products to maybe evolve to the next step. And Birkenstock is a very well-known company for you know, what is considered sort of a hippie, 70s kind of looking um, uh, uh, product. They have very interesting technologies which are recycled um, and they, they sort of recycle the inner parts of the shoe and they use um, latex, um, natural latex and, and recycled um, uh, cork. So what we did is we, we went back to the inside of the shoe, um, added new biodegradable materials and tried to build a product um, from the inside out that kind of matched the, um, the, um, the principles of the company. Um, there was, as, as in some other, as with other projects, you know, there's the complexity of communicating with a, with a German factory from California um, where we had to create a lot of data and, and, um, and, and um, kind of work with them on, on making sure that data was interpreted correctly. Um, then there was a whole line of shoes that was done around this, uh, this project, including um, this notion of branding. And actually, the, the Footprints brand got abbreviated to FP and a lot of people accused us of, of branding it with our own name, which was Fuse Project. But I promise you, it, it took actually two weeks for us to realize that it was connected. Um, and the product w was launched a little bit differently. And um, it was, again, it was this notion of green design, but no granola. How do you, um, how do, you do something different with it? So 
we then went on and did sort of more projects with, um, with, with Birkenstock, and some of them were about um, taking the aesthetic of nature and mixing it with actually the natural materials that were being used um, in there. Um, some of the projects were more about experimenting. This is called the Birkenstock. Um, you, can, <coughs> you can throw it in the wash and, um, and um, it comes out the right way. I mean, the, the fun thing was, you know, we always make fun of, um, of uh, people wearing the, Birkenst the Birkenstocks with white socks, and I thought, you know, maybe we could try to make that sexy. I don't know if, we, if it worked out or not. We, um, we also worked on, on new um, shoes which are um, sort of uh, low-cost plastic, very, very lightweight um, uh, little products that use the same fit and the same principles. And so sometimes we can affect, you know, we can affect a, a, a business, a, a certain company. And then at other times, um, we can look at, at, at an industry. In this case, we were looking at uh, protection, helmets and body protection for skiing and snowboarding. And when, you know, we looked out around the room uh, in the office, it was clear that there were, two no, two, there were no two heads alike, that, that, that the heads were, were completely... Uh, different and so how do you make something uh, comfortable uh, you know that is made out of a hard protective shell that you sort of have to sort of push your head you know into it um, so we came up with um, I think I think um, um, a, a direction that is um, that is fairly unique which was about using plates instead so there's four plates that move about um, and we worked with the French engineering group and we're able to, um, to allow the user to use a, a, um, a sort of a, something to, to a BOA, basically, which is a, a cable system to move the, um, the plates in three dimension around the head. And it also became a lot more low profile. Um, and we were able to also have different materials. So we're using a sort of fabric covered. And I think that's what we're. Um, that's what we believed in, to this, in, the, in this soft protection here. Um, and then this other project was actually about the body. So most protection on the body is typically plates and things that you strap on that are heavy and make you hot. Um, and in this case, we just wanted to integrate it to the inner layer. Um, and, and for it to be more about all the little falls and the little hits that you get during the day um, and, and that protection to be, to be in place. So we worked on, on this integration and on this notion of, of, of comfort. Um, and we, we, we had this material laying around for about three years in the office. It's a 3D mesh. It's actually hollow. It's a, it's a sort of a hollow structure made of thousands of vertical posts inside two layers of fabric. And we, we never knew what to do with it. I attempted to use it on a fashion project, but it didn't, it didn't make it. Um, but then by building the vertical posts, by building uh, thousands of vertical posts, we were able to make this material um, actually rigid and resistant, semi-rigid and semi-resistant, and then we were able to mold it as well. So now this sort of protection is not just the um, uh, comfortable spot on the body, it's also the most aerated spot on the body. Typically, um, where you put protection is where you get hot. So, you know, as, uh, I think this, this um, as we saw today, there's so much of the life perspective um, in design that comes straight from the designers. Um, it's really, a lot of the work um, is really about their life, about their background. Um, and, you know, how do you connect that with, with, with a certain economy? Uh, Bruce Nussbaum of Business Week said, the knowledge economy is commoditized. And um, now we are entering the creativity economy. Well, I think designers are in the, in the best place to, to participate in that creativity economy um, because in the, creati you know, the creativity economy is made of people, not companies. Um, it's made of niche markets, um, niche markets which are the new mass markets. And in many ways, designers know all about niche markets. Um, because they talk to individuals, because they think about, um, about people, um, and they think that the consumer is actually smart rather than stupid. Um, 
And designers also involve many people from, from different places. Um, you know, it, I think I really believe that it often demands a, a very wide perspective. And for example, in our office, we have about um, 28 designers, but they come from, from five different continents. They come from um, everywhere, not actually even Africa, but Northern Africa, not South Africa. So maybe we need to do something about that. And the creativity economy is about experience, not just about consumption. And when you, when you look at sort of the, the, the current state of consumption, it's quite overwhelming. Um, so often as designers, we look for a pause. We look for uh, a moment of calm. We look for, for, for that surprise. And I think a lot of the projects that we did initially um, when, when, when I started were very small projects for very small companies. Often people I knew very well, friends. Um, this is a, this is a, um, a perfume bottle. And in a, in a way, it was trying to respect the notion of the tradition of putting perfume on, um, putting it on with a wand, being able to, um, to, to have that kind of relationship with a product. But in this case, um, I wanted to, to, to kind of redefine the notion of the container and also redefine the notion of the space around, um, around the body. Uh, uh, you know, when you put perfume on, there's another sort of amount of space that happens. So actually, the, um, the uh, perfume is only contained in this rather small area. And then we went on and for the same brand, we designed these portable, very small um, uh, perfume bottles. And those are encased in rubber. So um, if you drop them, they, they bounce. And, um, and, uh, but there's the same principle that you can still access the product uh, by, by hand and putting it on by hand. We also worked with with um, this company called Lutz and Padmos, and they, they make sort of cashmere sweaters, and they're sort of Italian-made, and um, in this case, we mixed Teflon. We found a way to create a Teflon bath onto the cashmere, which, which makes it water repellent, and um, so sort of created a new, um, a new possibility for this, um, for this company. <clears throat> Most importantly, I think, we need to reinvent, and as designers, we can reinvent the relationship between industry and customer. Um, most of that relationship, as Satyendra was talking about earlier, is really about um, advertising. And I don't know how many advertising people are here, but when you just go out and you advertise to people, eventually that's what they see. So rather than going out and telling them, I love you, I believe in making things that make them come to you instead. Um, there was a project which was an important project for us that came uh, um, about four years ago. And the Mini was just launching. And we were kind of invited to propose some, 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 some ideas. And this idea there was for a car company to participate in the world in a completely different way. So in this case, it was a, um, you know, whether it's a, um, a, a tent for emergency kind of diagnostic, whether it was for a soup kitchen on the side of the street. The idea is that you would create this concept and then companies, NGOs would come to you and, and use, the, use the product. And we felt, well, that is a good investment compared to, um, to, um, to advertising. But of course, they also asked us to do some, some I mean, we actually built those and they, um, they were well received. But they also asked us to uh, create some, some real products. And, um, the assignment was to design um, trinkets. No, not really. I mean, yes, they wanted us to, to put logos on products, um, which eventually would be about, about the brand. Um, we went back and we said, well, we want the, the line. We, 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 we feel that this is a company that has a lot of heritage, that's about innovation, um, and there is this notion of, of motion and movement in it. So why not make actually products that um, are, are valid, have some, have some innovation to them. Um, so we, we went on and, and worked with Puma and we worked on this watch that I'm wearing where the d display changes from horizontal to vertical. So when you're playing the keyboard or playing the piano, you can actually read the display 
uh, in movement. It's actually also became very practical. This project was done before 2001. Um, I mean, before September 11, 2001. And now that you have to undress, this is like really fast. Um, you know, when you get through security. Um, we also worked on uh, luggage um, and um, this actually, this new line of, um, of clothing, which uses a new material. Um, um, and those, those materials are actually neither knit nor woven. They're actually stitched together with lycra, um, uh, Lycra uh, thread, and that creates a, this pretty amazing uh, stretch. You can also cut it in any place, so you don't need to sort of stitch uh, the ends. And we also um, connected the, um, the garments to the technology we carry, whether it's an MP3 or a cell phone, but created a protective layer um, to, to insulate the, um, the wearer from, um, from the radiations that come from the cell phone, for example. <clears throat> Two more little chapters. Um, Ecotech is what I call sort of a, a, a technological approach to ecology. Um, sustain sustainability is not about doing less and less and sort of walking ourselves out to um, no production ever anymore. Um, it's, it's probably about doing things smarter. It's probably about um, adapting new technologies, new materials, and new processes. And designers, as we saw this week, that's what they do. That's what they do really well. Um, and I think there's so many better examples than um, that were shown before, but I'll show this one anyway. Um, this is um, a st starch packaging. Um, so it's made out of starch, and it's, it's cut into the shapes of what you're actually going to buy. So you don't have to kind of pull every piece of underwear you know, um, um, out of its packaging to figure that out, which is kind of what happens now. Uh, when you throw it in the um, washing machine, the cycle essentially breaks down the starch um, fiber and dilutes the starch fiber, and what comes out is the underwear <coughs> at the end here. But, um, and besides, you should really wash your underwear before you, um, before you wear it, after you've bought it. I think women do that, but men has, haven't gotten, gotten the message yet. <clears throat> so that's sort of the results um, of this project. Um, we, were, we also worked a, a lot on, um, this was five years ago for the Museum of Modern Art, we worked on the future of shoes and this notion of adaptive technology, of technologies that adapt to you rather than you having to sort of fight them and, and turn them on and off and having them um, sort of uh, uh, tuned to what your needs are. Um, in this case, there's a, there's a, um, uh, a chip within the, this shoe, this future shoe, that allows it to know about uh, your changes in weight, pronation, and then you basically bring this shoe back to the store and they will make a better shoe. So you get a new, you get a new style, but you also get a better product. And this idea of, adapting techno of adaptive technology changing the way new interface with business um, is, is one that's always uh, interested, um, interested me. Um, and four years later, some of these projects, some of these notions just take um, quite a while to develop. Four years later, we had um, this, this headset project, which actually uses a sensor that, that touches the skin and can differentiate between the sounds that emanate from the, the people that talks from um, the environment. So essentially it splices out. It knows by feeling you when you're talking and when you're not talking. So you can be at the bar and you can call your boss and it will not know where you are. But you can also turn it off if you're at the beach and you want your friends to know that you're at the beach. <clears throat> and um, we do a lot of, of technology products, but um, um, I'm, I'm always more angry than pleased with, uh, with technology. But this was an interesting project where we, we looked at um, the medium, what people really want to do with their laptops in their home. And um, they, they, you know, they want to surf maybe a little bit, they want to watch a DVD, and the notion is that the way the, the, the computer transforms is all about the media, what you want to watch, and not about uh, the medium. Um, so we developed this, this uh, new hinge. Um, so, <clears throat> the other thing we do is, is 
we extend, we go outside, we go beyond um, what we were trained to do. And um, I, think, I think there is a very exciting time, time right now in design where essentially architects, fashion designers, uh, um, industrial designers, furniture designers are all sort of sharing um, the fields, the, all sharing the economy that comes out of these fields um, and are able to cross-pollinate and do different, different things with what they know. Um, so th there's quite a few, I would say, different projects that I didn't expect to, to do that have, that have come to us. One of them is the OLPC. So not everybody might know what it is, but it's a one laptop per child. Um, uh, it's an MIT project. And essentially, it's, a, it's the development of a $100 computer, uh, which is uh, bought by governments and given away to hundreds of thousands and millions of kids for education uh, purposes. And it has, it, I can't show you any images, but actually I've been told I can talk about it. Um, and, and it's this amazing initiative that comes out of, um, of Harvard and MIT that Nicolas Negroponte is pushing forward. Um, what, you know, what's, the other thing that is amazing is like so many different things change when you, when you, when you look at a different paradigm. Um, this laptop, for example, because it's not, you know, it's, it's not made by Microsoft, it's not made by Dell, it's really made directly at the factories who make the products for Microsoft and Dell. Um, it also has, so it goes around the existing systems, the existing companies, um, and the other thing it does is um, because it has, it has this ability to, to use a mesh network to connect, um, to connect together. So imagine if you drop 100,000 of these computers in Cape Town, only one of them, because they can communicate with each other uh, via long-range Wi-Fi, only one of them needs to be connected to the Internet um, or to Skype in order to allow for, um, for all the kids to be um, you know, on the Internet or to be communicating with each other or to be downloading lessons and text and uh, stories from, um, from other places. So it's, it's a really pretty amazing, if technology can go to these places, it's a pretty amazing um, revolution that could happen. Right now, there's um, 7 million of these on order uh, by about um, 10 countries around the world. And um, they're planned to ship, if all goes well, um, in, um, in less than a, than a year, in fact. So it's a pretty exciting uh, venture, but no images. We're also working on, on everyday products. I mean, what makes me more, you know, what can you, what, what's the worst experience at opening a pale bottle? Um, you know, lots of people just take the pill bottle, put it in, um, in, the, um, in the door jam, and just smash it on because it actually is so hard to, to open it up. Um, and this is work that we've been doing that was shown at the uh, Safe Show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, which is about a different way to open and, and different way to um, interface with a product. We also think about um, digital wallpaper, um, and how it can affect the walls and the environment around us. And we're also moving into spaces and environments. Um, here it's actually a design store, but not one that, we're, that we tried to make, uh, to, we didn't want to make it look like a museum. We didn't make it, want to make it look like white walls and whatnot. So we used reclaimed woods and we used a lot of hand uh, quotes and whatnot um, on this project. And this is what happens when we have a bit of fun with it. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if I, can, if I can conclude, I think that, you know, this, this notion of the new economy uh, in design is, is and, and design being the new economy and creativity being the new economy is definitely happening. There's no going back and it allows us, it puts us into a great new position. It also means, though, that um, we need to stay connected with where we started which um, you know, is a lot about culture, and is a lot about respecting culture, evolving culture, uh, building culture, um, and, um, you know, and, uh, and, and, and we should really not lose that. We should really uh, hold on to that, because that's, um, that's where we come from, and that's what makes us love what we, what we do.